welcome back. I'm Dr. Bob Cargill, and we are delighted to have with us here today a colleague of mine, a professor of mine, renowned UCLA Egyptologist Kara Cooney. Dr. Cooney is professor of Egyptian art and architecture and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA. Among many other things, her research focuses on the reuse of coffins, primarily focusing on Egypt's 21st dynasty, as well as the socioeconomic and political turmoil that plagued that period, ultimately affecting those funerary and burial practices in ancient Egypt. She is the author of many, many books, including The Good Kings, Absolute Power in Ancient Egypt and the Modern World, When Women Ruled the World, Six Queens of Egypt, The Woman Who Would Be King, Hatshepsut's Rise to Power in Ancient Egypt, and she has a forthcoming book, Recycling for Death, Coffin Reuse in Ancient Egypt and the Theban Royal Caches, which will be come out here in 2024 with the American University in Cairo Press. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend and colleague, Dr. Kara Cooney. Oh, thanks, Bob. You've just aged me by calling me your professor at one time, but we'll <laughs> let it go. We'll let that go and let everyone try to do the math and go, wait a minute, how can this be? But it can easily be. Well, the fact that that this has come along uh, makes me look much, much older than you. So people, th let them be confused. Let them be confused. Be confused. Yeah. Be very confused. No, this is good. Good to see you. How is Los Angeles? <laughs> it's okay. We just had a hurricane that apparently erased our our drought. I mean, not from the Colorado River <laughs> perspective and not from the aquifer's perspective, but apparently the drought is um, is no more for a brief instant in time yeah, to what climate change has remote. in store for us in the future. But the traffic's moment, still there. Little, yeah. Not so bad, actually, because everyone's moving to Arizona and Texas <laughs> and the like. And so I think we've lost a couple million people at least. And and it's kind of awesome, though we are still the home of the homeless, as anyone who's been to Los Angeles or San Francisco or Sacramento knows. It's not it's not easy from that perspective. And yeah. It is like a zombie apocalypse. And I'm, I'm being straight up. You have to live here to see it and see what the drugs do to people, yeah. what the current the crop of drugs are doing to people's yeah. brains and bodies. And it's, it's um, you know, all those zombie movies were prescient. So there is that for Los Angeles, which, which makes the apocalypse more about humans than not and um, makes me as a social historian think about things in a different way. Um, yeah, so, there's, yeah. Always, there's always something coming along and changing the way the population has to respond to the world around them. Yeah. And especially those of us who were studying the way that people react to the, the pressures on them. Uh, but you're doing okay, right? You're, you're hanging in there? I'm hanging in there. UCLA is doing well. Our grad students just won a big uh, strike contest with the um, University of California, and they now have 51% more in pay than they had before, which Excellent. is great. Excellent. And, um, and, you know, dealing, the rents are coming down, that, which is why the grad students struck in the first place. Right, rents right. became just, we all, we could talk about late capitalist private equity firms buying up everything and then charging eight times the price, but right. we don't need to, you know, we're, we're, we're social historians of crisis. It, it's all around us, but you know, that's better. And as chair, I like to keep everyone fed and safe and clothed right. and, right. you know, so UCLA is doing well and, um, we're ready for another academic year um, in this September. So, yeah. That's right. You guys haven't started back yet. We just started no. back here at Iowa. So we're yeah. we're one week done. And um, yeah, no, it's- No, uh, I, got, I got two or three more weeks. Please let me have that. Yeah, you've got- Don't them. take you've them from them. me. The things have already started up. Yeah. They've already started up. It's yeah, no, you, well, as an administrator, yeah. you have to you have to start back a little, little before everyone else. Um, but at least you get to, on occasion, study your actual chosen field of research. So if we can, let's let's chat about ancient Egypt yeah. just yeah. a little bit. Um, you not only do research and write, you know, uh, monographs and, and research, but you also, mm -hmm. uh, and this is one of the things that you know that we have in common. You also do a lot of public scholarship. So you write trade volumes, and and you're interested in talking to the public as well as talking to other scholars. Why is ancient Egypt so popular, right? Why why is the public fixated on mummies and pyramids all the time? And and you are always uh, writing popular books. You're on television talking about ancient Egypt. Why are we fascinated with ancient Egypt? 
Yeah, I mean, wouldn't the Byzantinists of the world love to know? Wouldn't <laughs> the you know medieval scholars love to know why everyone wants to know all about ancient Egypt and why I am so obsessed with ancient Egypt? I mean, my mother would love to know what the hell is up with that. Um, but, the, you know, I've thought about this a lot, particularly since I served as one of the curators on the reboot of the King Tut exhibitions way back in 2005. And that was at the L.A. County Museum of Art. And I saw people um, almost banging down the doors to get in. I saw the claims of ancient Egypt. Is King Tut black? Was he white? How do we understand these things? Um, and And I've noticed that Egypt is all about power. It's all about power and and it's all about claims of that power. Mm -hmm. And it's about, in many ways, political power, but a kind of secret ideological power that we would love to know. And so Egypt excels, excel, I, I'm sorry to talk about it in the present tense, but you know, this is my world and life, but Egypt excelled in presenting its secret knowledge in a way where you can almost touch it mm -hmm. and yet not such that you can see a hieroglyphic text and you can see, oh, that's a sunrise or sunset, or, oh, that's a little animal, or there's a little human and the little human is getting his head bashed in or something. You can see the little pictures, but you can't actually read the text because mm -hmm. the text is like all texts of the Bronze Age and exclusionary, um, socially exclusionary world in which learning to read and write is very difficult, arguably purposefully so, mm -hmm. to keep certain people in the haves category and many, many others in the have-nots category. But Egypt makes it makes you feel like, oh, I can kind of, I can kind of get it. And they show you a little bit, and you're and you're like, oh my God, they have these these secrets to power. And so that's from the text perspective. Imagine that you're an ancient Egyptian and the your landlord has died. And the funeral of the landlord is happening and you see that he's been mummified and you're like, what is this? You know, um, no one in your peasant family will be mummified, mm -hmm. but this landlord is mummified and he's all wrapped up and he's like a God and it's this crazy thing. And you, you realize that he's different mm -hmm. from you. There's a social differentiation. His body will last forever. Yours will very well rot given the, the graveyard that your family has for your bodies. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a prosperity gospel with ancient Egypt that I think Americans in particular really like, mm -hmm. and that, that makes people think, oh, those people are supposed to be leaders and jobs creators, and those people are not. And people are attracted to that kind of power. They're attracted to a good authoritarianism, which is where I wrote that book, The Good Kings. Right. It's, it's all about why we see Ramses II as great, and, and what it says about us, rather than about the ancient Egyptians, that we drink that Kool-Aid so to speak, that, mm -hmm. that we fall for that propaganda, that we look at pyramids. And many of us, and I know you were on the show Ancient Aliens, though I kept turning them down. <laughs> you know, many people look at the pyramids and they, they think oh, it's, it can't have been built by human hands. It's right. too big, this 50-story mountain of stone. It's too much. There must be otherworldly help, alien help, Atlantean help, whatever it is you want to put in there. Right. But every time a human being today has that thought, then the ancient Egyptian propaganda is still working on your mind. Yeah. And those weapons of the mind are things that people just want in their lives. They want to crack that. The Egyptians did it best, yeah. arguably. And so we just, you know, why did Mark Antony go there? Julius Caesar before him. Why, um, why are these powerful men seduced by Egypt? And what do they pull and package from it? Why does the Pope dress like, in many ways, like an ancient Egyptian king? Why is incense used in the Catholic Church yeah. to the four corners? And to, you know, I mean, it could go on and on. Yeah. But um, but there's great power there, and 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 that's why. And the gold doesn't hurt, does it, Bob? Because that that's so. You know, if I like to use my Michael Mann little rubric, there's economic power with all the gold and the minerals and the shiny things. Right. There's ideological power, all of the religion, all of the nationalism. Right. There's military power, Pharaoh striking down all of these different these different entities. And of course, there's political power, this unyielding kingship that lasts for over 3,000 years, unlike any other place on earth. So, I mean, it sounds sexy still, right? It is. And, <laughs> so. it, it's, a, well, and it's a fascinating place. And I always, you know, from what I do for a living studying the Bible, look at it and add that that fifth component, right? It's, you know, is Egypt, Egypt popular because of its tie-in with the Bible and the Exodus and all of that? 
But, you know, we know now from archaeology that Egypt was actually an ally with, with yeah. uh, Judah and with all of, you know, a lot of these. And yet, by the time the Bible's written down, they're the arch nemesis and the slavery and the exodus. But the reality of the archaeology was they were a lot closer. So there's some propaganda aspect even in the Bible. Yeah. No, the Bible, I've been thinking a lot about the Exodus story and, and looking at that as really a story narrative of the Bronze Age collapse, mm -hmm. the fall of the kingship of Egypt, the fall of Egypt's power, and the power vacuum that is then set up in the Iron Age world. And everyone's like, what the hell do we do now? Mm -hmm. what, what are we supposed to do now that this great pharaoh has fallen? You know, there's seas parting and people fleeing, but, you know, the back and forth movement between the Levant and Egypt was always there, is arguably in some ways still there, mm -hmm. though there's some hard barriers between Gaza and, and Egypt, but there are ways to get back and forth, mm -hmm. tunnels, other things. Um, these places are still connected, but, right. um, and ideologically, they're still, they're still connected. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, um, is the Bible important because of Egypt or is Egypt important because well, of the Bible today? I think it's a little bit of both. It's complex. I, I do think, and I think the affinity there, not just for us today, but in antiquity was they too were looking at these structures. They too were looking at the gold and the power saying, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we had something like that? How how can we get in on this? And it it truly was a model for everyone. And I and I like. But, the, you, but let me just break in really fast. Yeah. The idea of Pharaoh that the Bible really perfects as yeah. the nemesis, bad guy, evil genius, you know, with his ideological mm -hmm. abilities, is going to be then used by the Romans, the anti-king. We would never have a king. That's not something we're going to do. Right. It's going to be used in the Quran. The Pharaoh will act this way or that way. Mm -hmm. the, the Egypt has provided this this archetypal or archetypal bad guy right. of power that's that we want and yet don't all at the same time. Right. And just watching Egyptian nationalism deal with this makes it even more interesting to watch CC welcome all of those bodies into his presence and his new museum that he funded and built, but to try to differentiate himself from that kind right. of autocratic power. Tr try walking that balance yeah. beam. It's not an easy line That's to, a tough to walk. And, yeah. the, and the Bible itself even adopts that, that uh, paradigm for Solomon. You know, once mm -hmm. Solomon just becomes this, this brutal dictator, essentially this brutal king, that they start yeah. using language that holds up King Solomon as a pharaoh, right? He's yeah. using the corvée. He's he's sending him off to war. He wants to conquer everybody. It's they the Bible kind of looks at Solomon now as yes, you got the wise tradition, the wise king, the golden king, the you know this untouchable, you know, child of God, but he's also a brutal dictator. And the Bible and it's the justification for killing Caesar, and it's the forging of a new kingship by Octavian. Yeah. So it, it's used as this ideological trope on and on. Yeah. Um, obviously in the biblical worlds, it's you have these kings, but you have this very ambivalent and difficult relationship with these kings. Yeah. And because God is the one true king, right? Or the Messiah is right. the one true king. But then how do you deal with earthly political power? How do you, how do you work with that? Right. And it's, um, it's complicated. And it's, it's not as simple and easy as it was in ancient Egypt, for certain, king is chief priest, king is right. chief general, king is everything, right? Right, especially, yeah, when you start when you start uh, splitting up those roles. I, again, I, I, I'm I always trying to look at why we're fascinated by it, and then how Americans specifically consume news about Egypt. And I, you know, having worked in magazines and having worked with all of the television networks, I see how this news is marketed, and I, I did it myself, right? We we market, especially Egypt, to the public in a certain way, knowing that it's going to be consumed. Mummies and pyramids, right? Yeah. We, we're going to push yeah. it a certain way. How do Americans consume this news, and how does it make a difference for what we know and how we should be teaching ancient Egypt? <laughs> I mean, that's a massive question. Yeah. And I've, I've been on, I mean, I'll start with the second part first, yeah. but I've been on those LAUSD training programs where they bring in a bunch of sixth, seventh grade teachers. And they're like, here's, you know, sixth grade, usually here's Egypt. This is how we present it. What, how do you 
deal with this. And, um, you know, they, they present it as power, as an African power in California, at least. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think they would do that in Texas where I grew up, um, where, you know, slaves get good job opportunities now in the textbooks in Texas and Florida. Um, but, you know, there's this positivist uh, thread through all ancient Egyptian study in American schools, and I would argue in American media consumption, in which the the king is just the king. It becomes apolitical. We're not going to judge. The king did this or the king did that. But the king is also, he's a good guy. He's presented as this act access to an ideological power that we have lost. And if we could just get it back, we could maybe understand a little bit more about ourselves. But the short answer to your question is that it's inherently positivist. There's there's very little criticism. And I find it extraordinary even in the Muslim world where Pharaoh is is a bad guy in the Quran, right? And it, it, but it's it's become this positivist thing. This is your rich jobs creator guy who's going to keep you safe and and we want to connect with that like groupies, you know, we want to we want to be a part of that celebrity world. So we consume Egypt, King Tut in particular, in the same way that we consume the Kardashian story and and how we want to know about these wealthy people who had everything. And we just want to learn more. And, and you know, Pharaoh, he's just like us, you know, right. uh, King Tut had a cleft palate and a club foot, you know, and, and, and then you have these weird reconstructions and, oh my God, did he really look like that? What is he murdered? But he's still this, you know, extra special superhuman right. that's beyond our ken. So these two things are always worrying with each other, but the short story is it's a positive story. It's a right. story of power that we don't critique and that we want. And there's very little discussion of, social inequality, pyramidal social structures, um, uh, any sort of uh, critical Marxist bent. Um, when women are presented as, as power holders, it's you too, little girl, could be powerful as well without analyzing and complicating, oh, well, they didn't have as much power as you think. It's rather more of a tragedy than it is uh, a, a, an epic story of success that's brought power to all of the women of the world, BS, whatever. So it's... Um, you know, it's the story that we want to tell about the rulers that we want to have who would ideally keep us very, very safe. Yeah. So yeah. I, I've always seen that as one of the fallacies. I don't, maybe fallacy is not the right word, but one of the <clears throat> one of the the teases of capitalism and of democracy is is that we tend to be attracted to tyrants. We tend to be attracted to billionaires because on the of the off chance that it might happen to us. It just might happen to us if we catch a break or we work hard enough. Hey, that could be us. So I'll go ahead and support, you know, all the tax breaks for the for the wealthy. Because, you know, when I'm worth a billion dollars, I don't want anybody to to tax me. You want to take your money, no? Yeah, no, it's it and it's we buy into the narrative that favors the the wealth and the rich and the powerful. And I, you're saying I, what I'm hearing you say is that that's how we read ancient Egypt. If we choose politicians nowadays as the bully, the bully that's going to keep us safe and is going to beat up our enemies on the playground, yeah. then Egypt is the benevolent bully. And not just that Egypt provides the bully who has access to secrets that would help us to keep our world safer. Magic, mysteries. Yeah. The magic and mystery thing is a huge part of the power of this ancient civilization. People want to know how the dead were treated, how the dead were brought back into the world of the living. They want to know how the temple worked and all of the rituals. They want to know how the king lived. They, they want to know about all of those, those magical mysteries because some sort of understanding of that, if they can glean it, if they right. can understand it, then it might help them in their world today. So, you know, when I give a talk on ancient Egypt, people will then go right to, well, you know, but what, you know, the pyramids have this power to create, you know, they could create electrochemical power or what, or whatever, or um, Karnak temple can do this or that, or I was there once and I connected with this divinity or, you know, um, 
that seems to be the part that really makes people most fervently connect with yeah. ancient Egyptian um, culture. And, and I'm here for it. I mean, you know, I study Egypt, so I can't just roll my eyes completely. If people really want to believe in these things, okay. Mm -hmm. But um, I can see with Egypt how it's used for white supremacy. Mm -hmm. I can see how it's used for Afrocentrism. I can see how it's um, how it's claimed by stakeholders, ideological stakeholders in the world today. And um, it's it's interesting to be able to track that and link it to yeah. very unequal um, late capitalist structures yeah. today. So, yeah, I remember when I you mentioned ancient aliens when they first asked me to be on it, and I just declined, and I declined, and I declined. And they finally asked me to be on as the debunker. And they basically said, tell us why this isn't the case. And I went on, I did every episode and I said, this isn't the case because, and I was the, you know, traditional skeptics and scholars. And then they cut to this. Uh, and I did that for every episode. And when they did the final cut of the first season, uh, they cut out a lot of my debunking. They cut out a lot of mm -hmm. my skepticism because it made too many of the viewers sad yeah it, it, it just yeah. It, they wanted the the prospect especially when it came to the egyptian stuff they yeah. wanted that possibility that this is they just didn't want it to be a lot of sweat and toil and hard slave labor thrown at or you know or paid labor even thrown at. what is draft labor there's a very yeah. fine line between draft right. labor and slave right. labor <laughs> no, it's, you know, egypt for, didn't need slaves because it had more than enough of its own people to exploit so you tell me if that's like a noble thing to right. not have the pyramids filled by slaves i mean yeah. right no, no, anyway. that's what i was i corrected myself <laughs> yeah. there, but yeah. you know these poorly paid people that they were just throwing yeah. at it with you know without all the osha regulations and yeah. uh and you know, and they they you can achieve monumental things if you just don't care about how you treat people. And and it's on both sides. Like yes. my book, The Good Kings, upset. I remember one of the first talks that I did for that book was for an RC chapter, American Research Center in Egypt. And RC chapters are full of pharaohs groupies. They're full of people who are like, I love ancient Egypt and don't question why. But <laughs> usually it's white people who have reasonable amounts of wealth and generational wealth in particular who think they've worked hard and have all of this and, and put all of their love and connection to ancient Egypt for whatever reason. I'm not saying that every RC person um, is, is a white supremacist, but I will tell you that the first time I started to present my work in the good Kings to an RC group, there was tremendous pushback from white men in particular telling me that I didn't know what I was talking about and all, who the hell do you think you are? And connecting these Egyptian kings to authoritarian rulers and asking what is authoritarianism? And why is it seductive to us? Very upsetting to people. But it was also upsetting to Black Americans and to uh, people who study ancient Egypt and connect it to the to their heritage mm -hmm. in, in a, an African sense. Because then I'm taking Egypt and saying, you know, <laughs> these people were incredibly socially unequal. These people represent the authoritarianism that we should all be fighting against and, and, and saying that your Afrocentrist claims are nothing more than patriarchal claims, just trying to say, oh, this is my power, not yours anymore, but it's still a power. And really, the whole point of that book was to try to understand what unequal patriarchal systems are, mm -hmm. how they co-opt women's power um, present it in a certain way to make their power seem that much more um, cuddly and soft, how they co-opt ideological power to make themselves seem God-given and how we still do these things today. And this is, um, it's, uh, it's upset a lot of people on both the left and the right, but it was a book that I needed to write. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I'm glad you did. And it brings me to two questions that I want to ask. And I'm trying to decide which one I want to go to first. So, yeah. So let me ask this one first. Why study? Why why is it important to study women specifically, not just in antiquity, but in Egypt? You know, you you've written about this. Why was that so essential to do specifically to study women in ancient Egypt? Well, I. I didn't want to just study women because there is women's 
classes, women in antiquity classes at universities all over the land, Mm -hmm. you know, and they end up being this, you know, it's half of the goddamn population. It's a whole lot of people. And you end up talking about things in a very generalist way that I find less interesting and, and it gets me nowhere. So you can talk about women of different status groups. You can talk about women um, in an elite group versus a peasant group. You can talk about childbirth because of course that's what our bodies can do. You can talk about um, the hearth and the home and you can try to reconstruct uh, a power in the home that women had that is overlooked. And I'm kind of rolling my eyes and you can tell that I'm doing this because I don't, I see a lot of women's studies in antiquity reconstructing a power that women did not have in patriarchal systems. And it kind of makes me crazy uh, to see people say, look, these women actually did have power in the home. And I'm like, okay, great. Could they go into the halls of power and change their lives? No. Could they decide when to get married or how? No. Could they decide to get divorced? No. I mean, in Egypt, there are exceptions for this, but really it's it's not an easy thing to do. Um, so I wanted to study women in power. And the more I put those two things together, the, the more interesting the subject got. Mm-hmm. And so now at UCLA, I teach a course, and you know this, of course, called Women in Power in the Ancient World. And we spend half of the course on Egypt, and then we'll do a week on ancient Greece, a week on the Levant, a week on Mesopotamia, a week on India, a week on Rome, um, and a week on Persia. I think that's and a week on China. A 10-week course. There's only so much you can do, right? And it's kind of like a an old world civilization course, but through the lens, through a feminist lens of why is there no power for women, which asks the question, what is patriarchy? How old is patriarchy? It's not that old. It's, it's really not. If humans have been on this planet for a quarter of a million years, let's go for 250,000 years, Mm -hmm. which is a drop in the bucket for the earth, but okay, fine. But we've been here for 250,000 years. We've lived in different social systems than we have for the last 5,000, 6,000 for certain. Mm -hmm. Our DNA, our social systems, our brains are conditioned to work for very different social systems than what we have lived in in the last 5,000. And evolutionarily, we have not caught up, which is why as soon as there is some sort of intermediate period, as the Egyptians call it, between political um, moments, people move back to different kinds of social systems. Um, And today, as soon as there's a a laxness in social structuring in a a patriarchal way, people are deciding, oh my God, I'm actually a woman, or oh my God, I don't fit the binary in this way, or I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have kids. I'm not going to do this patriarchal stuff. I would argue this because our bodies and brains are not primed to, to work in that kind of a structure. But what does it mean then for women to be commodified and co-opted within the force binary, within that structure? How can they transcend it sometimes to get out? Um, and Egypt is a place where women do transcend that power and find their way out. So as I'm existing in what I believe is the beginning of a new human revolution. Mm -hmm. This is a big statement I'm making, Bob. Yeah, no, I'm right now, yeah. (laughs) I think we all feel it, left and right. Everyone knows we're on the beginning of a new human revolution. I I imagine it was like this when the agricultural revolution began. And people were like, wait, what the hell? People are moving to this weird city over there and they're like collecting grain and shit? Okay. (laughs) And and some people will go and they'll hear about it, but it's they feel that something's changing, Right, right? right? And the industrial revolution, people are like, I can't see my hand in front of my face because there's smog everywhere in this weird city of London that we're in. Or Alexandria, you know, could argue the the Industrial Revolution started in in late antiquity. I think you could do that. Um, We know when we're in these human revolutions. We feel it. And right now, I think we are at the beginning of an an anti-patriarchal revolution. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say post-patriarchal because there is way too much battling to go first. (laughs) No way. So we are in an anti-patriarchal revolution in which some people like we got to go back and be more patriarchal than we ever were before. And this is ideologically demonstrated, nationalistically Mm -hmm. demonstrated, masculine toxicity and, you know, all of these things. And then there are other people like we need to go forward to something else, something new. What? We don't know. Some wokeness. We don't know what it is. But to be a woman in an imposed binary system, and I understand human sexuality and gender mm-hmm. is much more complex than this, mm-hmm. but the binary is still imposed on us. On and everyone. as more yeah. post-row um, laws are passed controlling my body, right. 
the more I realize that I'm in a, an enforced binary system. So don't tell me what feminist thinkers are thinking because I know what, what laws are, are telling me. Um, the more that we live in this world, the more I have to ask, how do women in this binary find power or people who don't identify as either? How do we find power within the imposed patriarchal structure? Right. How do we find our way to the other side of it? How do you change something within something? And so this whole women in power discussion for me has been as much about me and what I want to study as anybody else. But right. I think it's something we really need. And that's right. why these books that I write, people are like, oh, my God, what do you think is going to happen next? And I'm like, you know, I'm not a futuristic historian. I'm, I study antiquity, <laughs> but let's talk about it. And um, there is this great hunger, not just from women but from non-binary people, from men who are sick of what patriarchy's done to them, just look at the Boy Scouts and the Roman Catholic Church to see what it's done to men. And, and we, can, we can use antiquity as a lens for the future. And we can use what women have gone through and how they've been subsumed and commodified as, as sources, data sets, data points to think, okay, this is where we, this is where we need to fight. This is what we need to change. This is where we need to go in the future. Right. And the past is has never been more relevant. Do I know exactly what happened? Do I have my time machine? No. Right. Can I tell you what Akhenaten was thinking when he invented his weird monotheist religion? Right. No. Right. And is history a construct? Absolutely. But if it is a construct, and we do have these data points, let's try to understand where humanity has been right. so that we can understand where the hell we're going. And, and, so. and this is what I like about your work, but also about being in a classroom with you. And this is why I think no matter how much we go more online and how much we learn from videos like this, and, and just, it's still going to come down to being in and around scholars who are, to quote Alanis Morissette, you know, the only way out is through, right? You, yeah. you, you can't go back and you can't just report on what happened. Yeah. You have to work through these things. And the only way that I can work through these things is to look through these, you know, very male, very white eyes. But in, a, in an attempt to try to glean from people who don't look like me and don't act like me in the best way possible to understand how others are experiencing this life and how others experience history. How do yeah. others see history? And then to yeah. say we're there's a change going on computers are doing the thinking for us and it's happening at, a, at an incredibly rapid rate and we need yeah. to figure out not just how am i going to deal with this but how are we together going to to deal with this and how it's going to change how we understand history yeah and so i, I was just at a conference the international conference of egyptologists in leiden it happens every four years in a different location four years ago it was in in cairo in mm -hmm. egypt and Every, you know, people know my books. I'm not going to say everyone knows about my books, but most people there know about my, my mm -hmm. popular books and in which I boldly state that there is no a political history, that history is a construct that we're writing now. And it's more about us than it is about the ancient people. And we were in a discussion like a, you know, open mic discussion of the future of ancient Egypt. That was the title. Right. And there were a couple of white men, um, European in this case, mm -hmm. not that it really matters, who took umbrage with my statements on certain points, you can imagine, <laughs> and um, said, we need to not mix the, the modern world and the ancient discourse. And I just roll my eyes and I go, oh my God. I, and I just read an article the other day from 1965 by Gardner about female power. And if I'm sorry, but every history is political. Every yes. history is, yes. if it's the dominant politics, you will not see it because it's the water in which you swim. But as soon as some chick comes along or right. some black person comes along and says, yes, but we can write it from this perspective, then you go, oh, you're politicizing history when you've been politicizing it the whole time, but you cannot see it. That's right. And it just drives me crazy. It makes the eye roll so hard that I flip over in my chair. But this is still being said by scholars in their 60s, the boomer generation who don't want there to be a political history and can pretend it doesn't exist because their privilege allows them to do that. And it's super frustrating. I also heard women my age saying, you know, there was a discussion about women in power and queens right. and whatever, because we got all these queens. And and they're like, oh, thank God you're talking about women who have power. I'm so sick. And this was a dig at me. And I'm mm -hmm. not stupid. And I know this. Mm -hmm. I'm so sick of people saying that women didn't really have power when they absolutely did. And I'm just like, OK, so why don't you tell me then 
what their legacy was. Could they hand it on to their daughters? Were they able right. to change the system in any sort of feminist right. way? Hells no, right. they weren't. But you want to keep create your fiction because you're in an entitled privileged place and you want to feel good about it. So right. go for it. Um, but it just, you know, it, 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 it drives me absolutely insane. Yeah. So yes, I obviously get very. Yeah, animated. no, no. But, th but this is the, <laughs> the myth of teaching objective history is that it just empowers the status quo, right? Yeah. If you, I, I just teach it objectively. Yeah. All that's going to do is continue to, to enforce, reinforce whatever system we're in now. And yeah. to, to pretend that, Okay, I'm going to teach it from a particular angle. Okay, now you're just pushing one. So I like the idea of getting three or four or 10 or 20 different views on this. And, you know, this notion that we're, we're having to suffer under that you cannot teach a political point of view when you teach history or, God forbid, you can't teach certain points, aspects of history to kids because that's going to offend them. What it is offending is their parents. The, when I teach a second grade class and I've done my share of these, right? You go right. into the second grade class where they do Egypt. And I'm like, okay, do you guys know when somebody has got an awesome pair of sneakers and you want those sneakers, but your parents can't afford them. Well, mummification was just like this. Their eyes are like, they get it immediately. Yeah. Those kids were brought up in capitalism. They know exactly what it means right. what this social inequality is all about. And, and the more they think about it, the more they're like, oh yeah, this isn't, this isn't fair. And nobody teaches it that way. And, and one other thing, and I'm not trying to say, oh, my writing is better than other people's writing, but I, I will say that making things entertaining, modern and relevant is a hell of a lot more interesting than most of the coffee table BS books that are written about magic and mystery in ancient Egypt. I mean, how many facts can you possibly squeeze on a page and then people fall asleep and nobody reads these things, but they publish them because people buy them because they think they're going to find some mystery in the book, but no one's telling a story. No one's telling a narrative that connects with why we need to know. And it kind of drives me crazy. And as soon as you say, oh, we need to know because it's about us, then the story gets that much more interesting and it's super readable. And I had a conversation with a colleague who just retired from the Brooklyn Museum of Art is a curator, Ed Blyberg. And he goes, oh my God, Kara, I was reading your book and, um, and I'm sitting next to my wife and I'm laughing. And she goes, what are you reading? I thought you were reading an Egypt book. He goes, I am. And she goes, you never laugh when you're reading Egypt books. And he goes, well, this one's written by Kara. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying, oh, because I'm so funny or so awesome. I'm just saying that as soon as you start making the connections and people will go, oh my God, then it becomes that much more interesting and engaging than what we're currently doing, which is deadly boring. You have deadly. to personalize it. And you're and you're talking about mm -hmm. writing like multiple publishers have come to you and asked you to write books. I mean, who, who knew? <laughs> I know. It's like it they is keep a coming weird thing. Back. And yeah, it, isn't that odd? Also, who knew, Bob? Because the first, when I, a lit agent approached me and he said, you need to write a book about Hot Shepsut, I told him no. I said, I don't want to write a book about Hot Shepsut because I was a young scholar. I'm like, I do the 19th and 20th dynasty. She's 18th. What would people think? And he said, you know, why don't you write about a powerful woman? And I was like, oh, well, okay, maybe I will. And I, and I did. And I had to learn all about Hatshepsut. And, you know, it's, it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving these, these women are like, they keep tugging on, on me. They keep going, nope, we need you to tell another story. Nope. You have to write something else. I'm like, come on. Now I'm like the the popular, you know, chiclet, uh, nonfiction woman. Okay. But they're like, no, I need another. Yeah. I need you to do something else. I'm like, all right, fine. I'll, this, I'll figure. <laughs> this was the transition that I, I'd like to think that I, I, I was okay at making it because I was already pretty good at lecturing and stuff. But when I first uh, was signed to do cities, I kept writing a textbook and they kept saying, no, that's not why we signed you to do this. Tell yeah. us about you, make it relevant, yeah. Tell, get, yeah. get emotional, get, yeah. and you know, and when I'm in the classroom, that's what I do. And they, they, yeah. they come, they, they, I, they're fixed and you have to write that way. You have to write with a passion. And yeah. there's just so much pressure upon scholars to <clears throat> be stodgy and, you know, to well, be, let me tell you, my popular books have not served me well <laughs> in terms of, uh, popularity among my colleagues because they, I would say more of them than not think that it's a waste of my time. Yeah. I, uh, honestly, not honestly, this one. not this one, <laughs> but, but you and I are on a different kick and I'm, I know. I'm, I'm telling you, if it's any encouragement to you, that world will come to where we are 
before we'll go to where that world is. That that scholarship will come to where we're going along with the videos and along with the public scholarship will mesh with research scholarship going forward before it goes back to the old, you know, sit in the sit in the library and write monographs and talk to other scholars. That's dying. It's dead if it's yeah. not gone already. And it yeah. has it has to be something that engages the people from a I don't I don't political is the wrong word, but from an engaging, relevant, modern approach with multiple disciplines looking back yeah. at history. That's the only way it's going to work going forward. Yeah. I agree. No, it's t- I, I, I totally agree. Um, and, and you could very much argue that The Good Kings was written before its time. It was written at the beginning of a, or at the, sorry, at the end of a Trump presidency and written during the rise of nationalism globally. But I think people still didn't, they, they didn't want to see that their beloved apolitical history would be axed and how yeah. dare you. Right. And um, I'll, I'll stand by it. Yeah. Stand by it. Well, let me let me ask you another question that will be sure to uh, get a response from somebody out there. Uh, what color was Cleopatra? What race? <laughs> what, what, uh, well, we know the answer to the race. The, the reason I ask this question is we know from history uh, what her lineage was. We, we, we know who she was and yet there's still this debate. And I know, cause I watch it on Netflix, right. And I, and I read it on Reddit and I read it on, watch them on YouTube. There's still this fervent debate about it, but what did Cleopatra look like? Yeah. So, you know, first I'll say that American understandings of what black is, is a radical reclaiming of a word that we have made positive and well, that black people have made positive. I don't know if white people would necessarily see it as positive, but it's a, it's a construct that's also come out of chattel slavery and the one drop rule, which means that lighter skin people, black people can still count as quote unquote black, Mm -hmm. which in the modern African and middle Eastern world is a much more problematic construct. So the pushback against Cleopatra being black is coming from Greece, but really it's coming from Egypt. And it's coming from a white facing post-colonial Egypt that needs and wants to connect with the dominant power structure. And colonialism is a white uh, construct in, in Africa, and it created all kinds of horrors and social inequalities and problems and split an elite apart from a a mass of peasants in most African countries. And that elite was generally more aligned with a lighter skin color and their European overlords, whether they be French or British or whatever. And so we're dealing with two different ideas. So you, you can throw the word black around, which is what's thrown around. Right. And it's a word that doesn't communicate. We Americans know what it means. It does not mean the same thing in Arabic. It's a bad word in Arabic. It's a word associated with enslavement, with servitude, with being less than human. Mm -hmm. It's also a word that nowadays with the construction of Nile dams built in Ethiopia and Sudan, with an extraordinary political competition between what we might call sub-Saharan Africa, though that's becoming quickly a racist word, this Mm -hmm. sub-Saharan word, and North Africa. And so there's there's an impossibility of talking about what color even means, right? Now, having said all of that, Cleopatra comes from what we might call the 31st dynasty or or the Ptolemaic dynasty, beginning with the general Ptolemy I of Alexander the Great of Macedonian descent. So Greek mainland um, is left in Egypt at Alexander's death, takes over, marries um, a relative. And then you get this very close incestuous dynasty that is the longest of all Egyptian dynasties at about 300 years. That's that's pretty amazing. Lots of full brother, sister marriage. So, you know, how much full brother, sister marriage is actually going to work (laughs) <laughs> practically, it's not. There are a lot of Ptolemaic kings who are the product of a mistress, who are bastards, um, to use a, a Latin-based word, um, though the Greeks had their own, and had this idea of a monogamy being the only legal way of claiming power. But you can't make 
you know, the Ptolemies, for whatever reason, got rid of the harem and yet connected with incest to keep power in a way that the Egyptians did not. Right. So it's it's a strange uh, mix of some Egyptian things and some non-Egyptian things. But you have this very long-lived dynasty that's full of inbreeding from this Macedonian family, and yet also full of mistresses, many of whom may be Egyptian. Now, some of those mistresses could be from Nocritus and maybe um, people of Greek origin originally who were there in the Delta um, and, and not really Egyptian um, in an indigenous way, if we're going to use that word, which mm -hmm. is a problematic word for Egypt. Yeah. But some of them may have been more indigenous Egyptian. Most of these mistresses were probably not Southern Egyptian or Theban, but who that, what do I know? Right. Um, it's completely possible. We have, we have no way of knowing. But what we do know for Cleopatra is that her mother is not really mentioned. And if her mother would have been mentioned, which we would expect, then it would be, I think it's Cleopatra the fifth, I think, um, unless I'm getting that wrong. And this is Cleopatra the seventh that we're talking about. And I think the sixth doesn't really exist. But again, this is not my time period. Um, but because her mother's not mentioned, and because this woman, Cleopatra the seventh, spoke and read ancient Egyptian, it makes me think, it makes other scholars like Matthew Roller think that she had an Egyptian mother. Because as archaeologists know, um, language is often passed through the maternal lineage. And if you just hang out with a, a mixed race or mixed nationality, mixed language couple, you will see that language passes more easily through the mother in this patriarchal system, because that's the, the domestic language of the home. Whereas if the father comes in from a different place, the language is not as easily passed down because the father is outside of the home, the mother's inside the home um, in a patriarchal structure, right? So if language and... And um, being able to speak, being able to be immersed in something is very often connected with the maternal lineage. And because she was the first one, we are told, to be able to speak and, and read Egyptian, then it, it makes me think that there's something else going on here, that she could very well be a quarter or half Egyptian, depending on the identity of her actual mother, who is not mentioned. Mm -hmm. So... And, and that's just Cleopatra. Right. What was the lineage before? How many mistresses were there right. who produced children? And then what what else is going on? So, you know, and <laughs> was she white? Is the is what, right. you know, is she Elizabeth Taylor White? Right. Hells no. <laughs> um, this is a, we, I was just told by, um, by a minister from the Ministry of Antiquities that, that Elizabeth Taylor is the perfect Cleopatra. She's great. Um, and, and yet this Netflix one was, was wrong. The, the Jada Pinkett Smith, Smith Netflix series is horrible. <laughs> it's not a quality piece of programming. So I'll, I'll leave that there, but you know, they picked a woman who looks Egyptian uh, to play Cleopatra rather than picking a woman who, um, looks maybe Macedonian Greek plus Egyptian. Um, they picked somebody who arguably looks more like she's from Thebes um, than somebody who's from Cairo or, or the Delta today. Um, so I, I actually wouldn't have cast that actress, though I've heard her acting is good. I've only seen parts of it. I, it's fine. Um, but I, I would have cast somebody different that was a political it was an Afrocentrist political claim. Mm. I'm going to call it what it is. Mm. Um, yes, it's produced by a woman, but it's still a, a giant territorial claim of, oh, that's not your power. That's our power. Right. right? That's not this right. white power. That's black power. To me, I think we need to transcend these patriarchal claims of power. Mm -hmm. It's it's nothing more than that. And so was she a white person in our estimation? Like you and me? No. Was she a black person? Probably not. No. Um, and how was she in between? Yes. And then how do we define that? I have no idea. Yeah. So it's, um, it's as complicated as it could possibly be. Right. It's a very interesting question, but, um, it's again, a question that's much more about us than it is about the ancient Greco Roman world, which really didn't give a shit. Right. And, and, and again, just that much more evidence that the whole concept of race is a construct brought about by us and, yeah that in the Mediterranean world, people were um, sleeping with and, uh, you know, uh, hooking up with 
the people that they saw, the people that were but, around them. And that was just but, a completely natural thing to do. Absolutely. But wow, is there a lot of power connected to race yeah, yes, right yes. right now in this world that we yes. have constructed. Yes. And I was just at this conference of Egyptologists, which was almost boycotted by the Egyptians because the Leiden Rijksmuseum van Oudheden, the, the um, state museum of antiquities, mm -hmm. had an exhibition on in which black musicians were connecting with ancient Egypt in their diaspora. So you had like, um, you know, a black musician playing trumpet in front of the pyramids and a photo, and then a connection with a musical instrument from ancient Egypt. And this was the exhibition at the mm -hmm. Rijks Museum. And Egypt was so upset with this connection between blackness and ancient Egypt that they gave speeches about it. They boycotted things. Really? They refused to speak in the museum wow. because Egypt is not black. And, you know, Zahi Hawass has said this in print in National Geographic magazine in 2005. He said that the ancient Egyptians were not Negroid. They were Caucasoid. And sometimes a much ruder word is used in Arabic translation when in Facebook it just translates it to English and you see yeah. the N word and you're like, oh my God. But these things are batted about. The yeah. idea that ancient Egypt was in any way associated with what we might call blackness. Yeah. Nothing makes people more upset. Even though if you go to Luxor today and you look at a person there, and then you brought them to 1954 in Alabama, that person would have sat at the back of the bus. It doesn't matter because Egypt is formed through the colonial trauma right. and thus cannot connect with blackness in a, in a positive way at all. Um, and black Americans do connect with it in a positive way. And so you have two agendas working in opposition to one another. And it's an interesting time. To, it's an interesting way to see it, but it's all about power. Yeah. And um I would rather, again, transcend these things and, and try to look at it through um, different kinds of lenses. We can be inclusive, yes. but it doesn't have to be about ter territorial claims. Agreed. And it's, it's the importance of reading about history and reading about and having actually broader, more in-depth discussions about what was actually going around uh, on in history instead of just trying to answer the question uh, with a, you know, with a 10 word answer or with, with a, with yeah. that 20 second sound bite. Yeah. Some questions can't be answered that way. And so no. you gave It's a, not the right research question to ask. It's correct. a research question about us. Correct. Um, you'll never know. You'll yeah. never know. And, and how interesting that we think of the ancient Egyptian Kings and then there are all these claims, Oh, the ancient Egyptian Kings were black. Well, the Theban Kings probably would have counted as black right. in the American definition. Right? right. Maybe not as dark as somebody from Ghana or Nigeria, certainly not. But they would have counted in an African-American perspective as black. Right. Whereas Ramses II wouldn't have because his ancestors are coming from the Northeast Delta, arguably from the Levant going further back. Right. You have a West Asian kingship that has a different look to it. But there's always intermixing. There's always wives and, and different genetic strains coming in. <laughs> and I always look at that National Geographic um, you can't get the data for it, but you can, they, they did a, a study of the current population of Egypt and make the claim that some 70% of the population is the same as what the ancient Egyptian population would have been, which means that you do get a 30% of the population brought in from um, occupation through ancient Greek um, and Roman times. You get population brought in from the Arab um, elite replacement. You get new population brought in from from colonialism through through time, but that you know thirty percent is very small um, in comparison to the hundred million people that currently occupy right. Egypt. So you know the, most of them are of ancient Egyptian origin in their genetics. This is absolutely fascinating, Kara. Let me ask you: um, you study death a lot, and you're not a very yeah. uh, morbid person, but but you study death. Let me ask you this. What does studying death, especially death in ancient Egypt, tell us about life? I mean, everything. So I, I grew up in a very socially competitive place in Houston, Texas, where people competed with their shoes and clothes and makeup and cars. And this. I was... Um, always the anthropologist kind of on the fringes looking in and not participating in this cotillion, this Texan cotillion, um, lots of side eye from, from this one <laughs> growing up there. And I also was Catholic in this Baptist 
evangelical world and was not included. Now I would be because we're, you know, the world has separated up into the white people and everybody else. Mm -hmm. And the Catholics are just as included in, in these circles now in Texas, I've noticed, which is really interesting and certainly on our Supreme Court. But I, I grew up watching social competition take place before me. And when I got into Egyptology, for whatever reason, I decided I wanted to try to track social competition. And there is no better way than to look at the paraphernalia of death. Mummification is one way, but studying dead bodies takes, you know, a whole forensic education and isn't necessarily my jam, plus they're smelly and I don't know. So, you know, you have to really love that forensic archaeology. No, that wasn't me. So I started to look at coffins in particular because it's, it, particularly for the New Kingdom and Third Intermediate Period, it's representative of a person. And it has texts on it that talk about all kinds of social aspects, the gender of the person, the title and occupation of the person. And then you can look at the coffin itself and you can understand spending abilities, ideological access, you know, did they know things that they're representing on the coffin that other people didn't know? There's, there's a ton of individualized social information on a coffin. And so I jumped into this coffin uh, material with both feet and started to compare how much people spent on coffins. And my first book is called The Cost of Death right? Which is very much about the old adage that the dead do not bury themselves, that mm -hmm. a funeral is more about the living than it is about mm -hmm. the dead. In the same way that when you get married, your wedding is more about your relatives and your parents than it is about the people getting married. Right. It is that social display, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the idea that something is containing the body and representing the individual is front and center. For everyone to look at in every ritual moment, there's a ton of care going into that coffin. And so I started to look at nesting coffin sets and which piece in the nesting set they spent more time and energy on. Oh, look, it's the innermost pieces that have the inlaid glass and the inlaid eyes and all of these special blue and green paints. And the outer coffin, you get less of that. But, you know, th th there's all kinds of ways of looking at this social inequality or attempts to draw the eye in, in um, the pageantry of death. And now I'm not trying to say that the ancient Egyptians made their funerals and coffins all about the living and just showing off mm -hmm. because it's also embedded in a religious world. And this is super interesting for me too. How do we co-opt and use religion for social purpose? And it doesn't discount cynically discount that we, that we don't believe in that religion. We do, mm -hmm. but then you display it, you display a kind of piety, you display a kind of, access to this religion that other people may not have. And if you disbelieve me, go hang out in whatever church you're a part of and listen to certain vocabulary, yeah. little turns of phrase where you're like, oh, that person's very far into this particular cult, or mm -hmm. this person understands how an evangelical Christian should speak to another evangelical mm -hmm. Christian, and, and they're a part of that group. Um, same thing with uh, Catholics. You could understand just from the way somebody's speaking, in terms of phrase, whether some, somebody is a more orthodox type Catholic, um, pre-Vatican II and holding on to that rather than not. So it's religion is um, as much a part of this as anything else, but it can also be socially displayed. And I'll say one last thing, and then you can come at me with more follow-up. But like Egyptologists are always talking about personal piety, personal piety, especially for the Ramesid period. Right. And so you'll walk into a tomb chapel that's decorated for the living to enter and to connect with the dead. And you'll see that there's all of this religious information and Amen is there and it's, and everyone's like, oh, it's personal piety. They're, they're, everyone's more fervently connected with the God in the 19th and 20th dynasties than they were in the 18th. And I, I, I have a different thing to say about that. I think that they were just as connected to the God in the 18th as they were in the 19th, but this, what we call personal piety uh, is actually a social display mm -hmm. of people saying, I connect to the institution of the temple, which is giving me my job, mm -hmm. which is keeping me safe more now than I connect to the institution of kingship, which I did in the 18th. And so you can, you can actually track social conditions and through funerary materials of elites, it's always rich people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll find some poor people. They're not going to give you as much stuff. Right. Um, but you can track how how the their institutions are working, where they're finding power, um, how they're surviving vis-a-vis -vis other rich people and competing with other rich people. So it's it's everything about 
normal people and normal human reactions and much less about the magic and mystery. But I find this much more intriguing myself. Yeah, this is fascinating. What I didn't hear you talk about is the afterlife and the, and the, and the, per, you know, the, the, when I've, when I've heard that question asked before, it's, you know, it's, it's about the afterlife and the preparation for the next world or, but yeah. you focus on, you know, what I believe a lot of people here are focusing on. And that is, um, that funerals are more about, again, as you said, the living than the dead. And yeah. it's about, um, the ritual. And yeah. I, I've, I've performed uh, a lot of, funerals. I've done far more weddings. Um, but it's always interesting to me when I when I get the bride and the groom together that they're saying, well, we want this and we'd like this. It's the mom and the dad that actually come in. And if not the wedding planner that are communicating on their behalf, the agent, you know, that are saying, actually, here's what we want. And yeah. pl please don't do that uh, because they're paying for it usually. Right. They're right. the ones. That, right. They, they have the final say. That's and there's a demand for conservatism. Yes. So we come in as scholars and say we get a wedding from 2023 20, preserved, you know, right. you get the program and you're like, oh my God, they're reading Psalm 48 or, or right. whatever. And they're doing this. And, oh, there was this, and we'll talk about it in our scholarship as this very um, known effort on the part of the people commissioning this wedding to connect with a certain text. And, and right. it's not that those things aren't real, but when you're at the wedding, who the hell cares about Psalm 48? Mm. They're looking at what the bride is wearing. They're looking Correct. at who's there. Correct. They're looking at the whole pageantry of the wedding. If something go, if something is a little too woke or in a religious structure or is a little too religious in something that's supposed to be woke, everyone's going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I was at a wedding where a woman promised to obey and I was like, oh, I would never. Right. And, but, but there's these lines that have to be maintained and crossed or not crossed. Mm -hmm. And, and this is where the, it's, it's kind of, it's always a tension, younger yes. generation versus older. Yeah. Um, and what needs to be there to make sure they're actually married right. <laughs> or transformed as a dead person. Right, right, right. Right. And that has to be there. You can't change that. Right. Can't change that element. But this you can mess with and this you can mess with over right. here, little shiny thing, little shiny thing. Right. Um, but the way we look at it as scholars is is completely off from the way we live it as human beings. Right. So that's that, a good the, point. and that's where I'm trying to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Fascinating. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's end with this. Uh, and thank you so much for giving us so much of your time and for, as always, one of the things I loved about you when I was back in L.A. there, so, so honest and so open and so giving of your time. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, what's My your, pleasure. What's your biggest pet peeve about teaching Egyptology? What's, what's, get, uh, limit it to one or two. <laughs> I mean, uh, I have so many right now and I've already brought up a lot of them, Bob. Yeah, so you let's have, see what I you can have. come up with yeah. new, like the idea that women were powerful. And I'm not saying that Hatch it wasn't powerful, but they pretty much destroyed her daughter on the way out. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, it's funny, this, this idea that we can't mix modern and ancient politics. Yeah. Um, or that we can't make history political right. is often given to me from the same people who claim that, like, I just got, okay, so I just got an article review. And you know what this is like. When you get an article review, you, reviewer number one, reviewer number two, here's what you have to do after your, right. your right. blind review. And I am writing an article about um, women in power or sexual power. And I'm using the Michael Mann framework, ideological, economic, military, and political power. And I'm adding this, an S, a sexual component sure. to this structure. And I, the reviewers are telling me that you, you put this into a binary world. How dare you? You haven't connected with all of the feminist literature. How dare you? And, and I'm like, look, we can, can, we can make history political, but you can't impose <laughs> a woke politics on the ancient world that didn't exist. And I, right. one of the reviewers said, gay men react to their babies. I'm like, do they leak breast milk? Cause you know, I don't <laughs> see that happening in the binary construct with the man's body in the way that it happens with a woman. So, you know, when that happens, we can talk, but it's, it's, it's still a fine line. It's not either or. It's not one or the other. If we're going to make history political and about us, we still have to embed ourselves in the structures of the ancient world and try to work with them as legitimately as we think they were. We can't make women more powerful than they were. 
Correct. We can't make men's bodies respond the way that we want to in a transgender world. Correct. And and so there there's a little give on each side. And okay. I hate it that it's an either or sort mm-hmm. of discussion. Mm-hmm. So it makes me kind of crazy. Yeah. And and if you could hear the conversations that Rosalind and I have about this very issue, that yeah. it's you are attempting to impose an ideology on reality and not just a reality, yeah. but a reality in history where this ideology didn't yet exist. It mm-hmm. cannot be done. And then yeah. on top of that, you're going to say, and therefore you're not going to be my friend. And we ostracize people and we stop talking to people and we cut up into our cliques. It is the exact opposite of what thoughtful, open-minded ought to be doing. Yeah, You cannot do that. The only way out is through. We have to talk to each other about it. You have to teach this history. We have to hear these different points of view. That's the only way out is to actually talk about it. And for both sides, both ends of the political spectrum, to actually be honest about what's actually going on. You can't pretend that this thing that wasn't a thing yeah it is is that this is the same <clears throat> as this other thing and i'm being very nondescript because i look like this but uh, you know i i i i'm i'm i understand the reality but i also understand that a lot of the things that we talk about today didn't exist or they were at least highly or were repressed. not allowed or had to exist in a deep secret cave correct and now yeah. thankfully there, we are in a world that is beginning to, and I'm all for it, rights, and, and you be whoever you want to be and live your best life and marry who you want to marry. I'm on your side, but let's at least be honest about who we are and, you know, genetically who we are, who we want to be, what these ideal ideals are and how those differ from all the diff- other different iterations and historically. And let's have yeah. that conversation and let, then let's go out and have a beer. What it is generally is people starting with the ideology rather than starting with the nuts and bolts yeah. of the economy. And I always start with the economy. If you start with the ideology and you pose that, impose that on the ancient world, the ideology of women in power now, right. then you'll find all kinds of women in power that continued their power and you'll right. make up all kinds of mythologies and fantasies and, and you'll recreate a new history. If you start with the, with the economy and you ask, how do you find an economic power in a harem community of the king. Like, people, we're not allowed to use the word harem anymore, Bob. Right. And I'm like, look, <laughs> I think the women who served in such a structure deserve nothing less than a word that makes us feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Because that word was economically meant to produce as many possible heirs for the king in this unequal society as possible. Right. It needs to be talked about in that way. Are you not going to use the word enslaved person anymore either? Right. It's- because it's the same thing to me. So it's, you know, it's, um, it, it's, uh, If we economically look at the woman in the patriarchal society, then you start to see her very much as livestock. That may make you feel uncomfortable, but you know what? It's the damn truth. It's supposed to make you uncomfortable. It is. So I would rather start with my equation to a cow in the ancient world. And and how does that how does that subsume me? How does that control my body? How does that make me go to the house and do laundry all day and take me away from the halls of power? How does that put me in a relationship that's asymmetrical, where I'm controlled from the age that I can produce future babies? Mm-hmm. If I start with the economy, and then I and then I see how ideology is laid over that, yeah. then it's going to it's going to all make sense. But people, um, scholars like to start with ideology rather yeah. than economic structures, and I, I find that wholly problematic. Yeah, follow the money, follow the money. No, I follow I'm, the I'm, money. Yeah. Or what? Well, how did they yeah. say it in the '90s? It's it's the economy, stupid. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. Thank I you. said that to a, a non-American the other day, and they're like, "Oh my God, you just called me stupid." I'm like, "Oh no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no! This is a Clinton quote. Yeah, no, this no, is no. an old, it's a James Carville <laughs> line." Uh, Kara, thank you so much for taking the time. This is fascinating. I cannot wait to uh, to look at this myself and to see how we're going to get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love it. You things. know, I love it. But it's true. I mean, every everything. This is a great conversation, and I can't wait uh, for all of our viewers to see it. Uh, please uh, take care of yourself. Stay safe on the streets of Los Angeles. Watch out for the floods. Uh, and and uh, from everyone here at Bible and Archaeology, uh, thank you for being here, and everything the best. Thank you so much, Bob. It was great fun. 
That was great. Yay. Thank you so much. Good this job, was, team. This was fascinating. Yeah. This was great. Well All right. done.